Hey folks and welcome back to Bhutan. This is going to be a really special episode of Field Tested. Two and a half years ago I rented the Fuji GFX 50S and brought it here for my first ever field tested video. Great camera and really fun video. Now in this video I've brought along the Fuji GFX 100, the new king of the hill. And to make things interesting I've also brought the 50S along to be my second camera so I can take them all across the country shooting in different weather conditions, different lighting, different challenging environments and see how they both compare side by side in real world situations. Let's check it out. Welcome to a new series where we take tech on the road, explore a travel destination and test the gear out in real life. This is Field Tested. Now I'm sure you know the specs of the GFX100. It's got a brand new 102 megapixel medium format size sensor, the same size mini medium format as the predecessor, the 50S and R. However, this is the first one that's got in-body image stabilization and it's doing 4K on the full sensor. In terms of lenses, I took a full array, my favorite for the system, the 110mm f2. I also took the 250 f4, the 100 to 200, the 23mm wide angle, the 32 to 64, and I took along the 75mm Noctilux from Leica via adapter, which also gives us almost full coverage. Now Fuji had sent me their new 50mm prime, but unfortunately the day before I was leaving they let me know it was a pre-production sample and that if I wanted to share any image taken with it I would have to send it for approval in Tokyo and that's not how I do reviews. So unfortunately I packed it back up and didn't take it on the trip. In this video we're going to fly to the far east of Bhutan and then drive our way back stopping at remote villages, traditional festivals, and some of my favorite places in the country. Now, I've actually been shooting with the GFX100 for a few weeks already. The trip is actually over, and I can tell you it is a remarkable camera. It truly breaks new ground in the market, and it has some of the best image quality I've ever seen from a digital camera. But it's still not something that I would even consider buying for myself. Stick around and I'm gonna tell you why. Now we timed our first night in Timpu on the same day that the locals celebrate Vishwakarma, which is an Indian god or deity who's considered the god of mechanics. So a lot of the car mechanics and railway people decorate all of their cars and workshops and have this huge party. So we went along and joined the festivities. I have to say this was really a baptism of fire for the GFX100 with lots of low light, lots of movement and a really hectic environment. The low light AF is not up to the standard of a high end DSLR but it's far and away ahead of pretty much any other digital medium format camera on the market. And this is a theme we're going to see again and again with this camera. Now Bhutan is a small, peaceful and low population country with only 700,000 people and it is an officially Buddhist country. And that means there's loads of temples, shrines and monks around. Really interesting for us travelers to photograph. If you're thinking of getting a high-end system like the GFX100, I suggest you rent it out for a long weekend, put it through its paces and see if it's going to meet your needs before you actually buy it. Check out my friends at Lens Pro to go. They sponsor this series and I get all of my rentals from them in North America. They have a great range of video and stills equipment. Use the code GEAROUT15 at checkout and you can get 15% off your order. Now, let's fly east.
Hi, from the foothills of the Himalayas, folks. I'm at a religious festival in eastern Bhutan now, just stepping away to give you some first thoughts about the GFX 100. So before the week I've been shooting with it on this trip, I've had it out for a couple of different loans. So I'm starting to get pretty familiar with it. A couple of the little bugbears that I always find with Fuji are still here, but overall it's really damn impressive. And the quandary I'm finding myself in is, should I be comparing it to high-end DSLRs or medium format cameras that are the biggest sensor medium format and much more expensive because should I be comparing it based on the category that it's in as a small medium format or should I be comparing it in the price range that it's in which is high-end full frame? I really don't know but what I can say is the image quality is beautiful when you get a perfect exposure. You do however probably need to double your normal hand holding speed because even with the sensor shift technology you really need to have a steady shot to get all hundred million of those pixels sharp. The video is also beautiful and the battery life is not bad so so far I'm really enjoying it but still struggling to see if it's something that I could integrate into my daily kit. Now this annual festival high in the mountains is held for the locals in support of getting a good harvest. It has nothing to do with putting on a show for tourists. In fact, we were the only travelers at this festival. <laughs> Apart from the songs and dance and revelry, two big traditions at this kind of event are drinking homemade aro, which is a fermentation of whatever grain they happen to grow, and then a tradition of getting puffed rice and using it as a blessing on people's cheeks, which at first is confronting, but after you've had it done a few times, is actually really fun, and you go home finding pieces of rice behind your ear for days to come. At the end of the festival, we're invited back to the village headman's home to continue the celebrations and have dinner in their altar room. More singing, more dancing, more drinks, and more puffed rice. All around the country of Bhutan are zongs, which are a cross between an administrative headquarters, a religious headquarters, and formerly was a fortress. They're usually positioned high on the hill with only the courthouse above them, Heading inside, it's where the monks live and learn and practice and where the local authorities are housed. And they're gorgeous. They vary in size and, you know, what exactly is inside. But essentially, there's going to be all kinds of prayers going on. And thanks to the relationships we've built up over time, we're able to get in and actually take photographs in a lot of these places that generally you can't. Next up, we headed up to the village of Marak, high in the mountains. It's a nomadic yak herding community. We were there for the day to meet and photograph with them and photograph the yaks. You can see this is a matriarchal society and the hats the ladies are wearing is so that when they're out in the field, the rain runs down and off those little tentacles and doesn't get in their face or down their clothing. And then it turns and bites me in the face. It's okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, folks, just jumping in real quick here. A couple of things I've found that are really annoying me. This is an amazing 102 megapixel sensor, but it's still using SD cards. Yes, they're UHS-2. Yes, it's great that it has two slots, 
but these just aren't as fast as something like XQD or CFast, which means after you take a series of shots, if you take three or four shots, then you have to wait for them to write and it locks the camera up. It won't even re-engage the EVF or let you go into menus whilst it's writing. So if you've done a long burst, that can really lock you out for a fair amount of time. And there's a couple of things I found that are quite buggy. The battery display is just inaccurate all the time. I fully charge the batteries and it'll often say either the left or right battery is about to run out and then two minutes later, having done nothing, it's showing that it's full again. Not handy when you're on the road and trying to maintain your battery supplies when you have limited time at a power point. And the other thing, it's locked up several times on this trip. Repeatedly, it becomes non-responsive and I have to take the batteries out and put it back in. One time when I was shooting video, I had to restart it. I took both the batteries out to charge them, put two fresh ones in. It was probably sitting for 10 minutes without batteries, put the batteries back in, and the whole camera needed to be reset, including the date and time and everything. And last night shooting long exposures, I found it repeatedly locked up. And then when I, you know, it wasn't responsive, I would turn it off, it would say sensor cleaning, and it would just freeze at that point for ages. And again, I have to pull the batteries in and out. So whilst there's a lot to love about this camera, there's a few things that still need to be polished. Thankfully, they all seem to be things that can be fixed in firmware. Thanks to catching an early flight, we ended up with half a day of extra free time in the East, which meant we could go out and visit my guide's family. He actually hadn't seen this side of the family in decades, so it was a real treat to meet up with his uncle and his uncle's children and play around with their pets and see how they prepare the crushed rice and corn and see them distilling their local ara as well. These portraits I got of the uncle were all taken with the 75mm Noctilux and the 100 megapixel GFX. Now you may have seen this in a previous video, but my wife and I sponsor a child in Bhutan. This is him, his name is Shirab. It was great, we had a good half a day to spend in his small town, see his, him and his mother, meet his new younger sister and hang out, play. I took them clothes shopping, got him some cool new soccer clothes and you know, just be able to bond with the family. Check the card above and you can see the full dedicated video on our day together. That prayer ceremony was so lovely. I'm really glad we could take our guests to that. That's exactly the kind of thing I try to put together for my guests. Things that are still traditional, undisturbed, that we can arrange special access to without disturbing it and doing it in a respectful way so that people can see things that normally are off limits to tourists or you can see but you're not allowed to photograph. So that was a lot of fun. And I have to say I was really impressed with the video footage that the GFX100 made there. The autofocus isn't perfect, but it's still pretty good. And the low light video quality, I think is just beautiful. I'm filming with it now as well.
Hey folks, I just got back into New York like an hour ago. I'm absolutely exhausted, but I wanted to run you through my thoughts on this camera whilst it's all front of mind. If you wanna see where else I'm headed in the world, head on over to macgranger.com forward slash workshops and thanks to Lens Pro to go for making this trip possible. Use the link above and below and you can get 15% off your next order. So, I've been shooting with this for five or six weeks intensely tens of thousands of frames in all kinds of situations and that's where you start to find issues with what, you know, at the surface may be just a flawless camera. Now, let me just give you a little idea of how my thought process has evolved on this. On the trip in Bhutan, I had some long drives and great opportunities to chat with the guests on my trip. And cutting a long story short, we were talking a lot about the process of photography and the output of photography and what it is about what we are shooting with and what we enjoy with it and what we don't. We had one guest who was shooting with APS-C, an older DSLR from Nikon, and I think two zooms, two primes. He loves that it's portable, is happy with the image quality, doesn't see a need to upgrade, and instead puts that money to more travel. We had another guest who was shooting with a pair of 120 film bodies, and he really likes the feeling engaged with the process and thinking of it as, as a craft rather than he would always find himself having thousands of shots to edit at the end of a trip and he didn't enjoy that. Both totally valid points of view in my mind. So coming back to the GFX 100, do I need 100 megapixels? No. I think there's very, very, very few people who actually need it. There are times where it would be useful and yes, double clicking in, the nerd in me, was shocked by the details and I did enjoy that, but that quickly fades and that thrill has already passed. Needs are one thing, wants are another. If I really enjoyed shooting with it or the results were better than I was getting with my other systems, then I am in a position I could justify buying this. I would say overall the shots, however, that I got with this were slightly below the standard I get when I take my DSLRs along. Of course, you can't compare a tour in 2018 to a tour in 2019, and it's nothing to do per se with the camera not being capable. It's maybe how inspired I am to actually shoot with it. I mean, if I Marikando the situation and think what's bringing me joy to shoot with, it's not this. I'll be honest, putting it down at the end of the day was more enjoyable, and picking this up in its place I enjoyed more, but I still wish that I had some of the other cameras that I've had the opportunity to shoot with. I just don't find it enjoyable. The buttons are probably the worst on any non point and shoot camera that I've experienced. Both of the shutter buttons, and this has the fixed one after they had the recall, are doughy and lacked any kind of tactile. The grips for any camera that has a built-in vertical grip are the worst I've used. This bottom one in particular is so uncomfortable to use and there's nothing really there to grip onto for a camera that weighs this much. So whilst it breaks new ground, the image quality, a dynamic range, it's fantastic. The stabilization should be a must on all 100 megapixel cameras. There's a lot here to like and if it suits the way you shoot, it's a no-brainer. But for me, it's also a no-brainer. I just don't enjoy shooting with it. If I were to go into the Fuji range at the moment for a GFX, I would go with their first one, the S, over the R or over the 100 personally. Love to hear what you guys think of that. Are you shooting with medium format? And for you, is it more about the process or the results and how do you find that balance in your shooting? I hope you enjoyed this, folks. I'll see you soon.